TRES-2b is a planet where night never ends. And it's not your regular night with stars shining in the beautiful skies. Here, it's pitch dark and scorching hot. TRES-2b is a gas giant, roughly one and a half times more massive than Jupiter, and its surface absorbs light better than charcoal. It might also have a faint dark red glow because of its burning air, which is as hot as fresh lava. Lovely. In the star system of 55 Cancri, there are five planets, four of which are gas giants similar to Jupiter and Saturn. But the fifth one, or rather the first because it's closest to the star, is different in a most horrible way. 55 Cancri E is so close to its sun that half the planet's surface is a literal ocean of molten lava. The other half is in eternal darkness because it never sees the sun. The planet is always turned to its star on one side. And between the scorching and the dark, there's the twilight zone, a thin strip of gloomy nothingness. HD 189377b – well, I'm not going to say that again – is the only exoplanet in the orbit of its star. And at first glance, it looks quite pretty – blue and white swirls making up wondrous patterns on the surface. But these pleasant colors actually come from hard silicate particles in the planet's atmosphere, which means it rains glass here. But the worst is that winds reach the speed of 5,400 miles per hour, or almost Mach 7. Well, for comparison, the fastest wind speed on Earth was 254 miles per hour, over 20 times less. Thus, the glass falling from the sky travels horizontally at hypersonic speeds, shredding everything in its path. The next system, whose name I won't even try to pronounce, um, this one, has three exoplanets, which are all being slowly destroyed by their own star. It happens because that star is not a regular. It's a pulsar, a rapidly spinning core of an exploded star. It creates powerful electromagnetic pulses in several directions while rotating at several thousand times per second. As a result, the planets orbiting this deceased star are slowly being eaten away and will eventually disappear entirely. Kepler 70 is a hot blue dwarf star that exploded into a red giant some 18 million years ago. At the time, it was orbited by at least two planets, the closer of which was a Jupiter-like gas giant. Its name was Kepler-70b, and it still exists. But the overgrown star consumed it and transformed it into a blazing hot rocky world. Right now, it's one of the hottest planets ever discovered. Its temperature is higher than the surface of our sun. It was lucky to survive spending time inside the star, but it's evaporating now and will probably be no more in the near future. WASP-12b is one of the weirdest and saddest planets out there. The enormous gravity of its star, combined with the planets consisting mostly of gas, result in the star slowly devouring its protege. WASP-12b has already taken the form of an egg, stretched toward its merciless sun, and it's unable to do anything with its condition. In another 10 million years, the planet will inevitably succumb to the voracious star's appetite. If you ever wondered what it's like to walk on ice and hot coals at the same time, Gliese 436b is a planet that would give you a vivid example. Being extremely close to its sun, the Neptune-sized exoplanet boasts temperatures hotter than a blazing oven. And yet, it's covered in ice, which burns incessantly. This ice is much denser due to the enormous gravity of the planet, staying solid even under extreme conditions and not melting away. No list of frightening worlds could do without mentioning Venus, the Earth's evil twin. The second planet from the Sun has an atmosphere so thick and full of clouds that its surface is much hotter than that of Mercury. Volcanic eruptions constantly thrash Venus. Its gravity is almost a hundred times stronger than ours. And those clouds I mentioned are not made of water, but of sulfuric acid, which condenses and rains down on the ground, adding to the inferno. But even if you were brave, or crazy, enough to try to pass through these clouds, you probably couldn't. The winds up there are as strong as some of the most powerful hurricanes back on Earth. Here we have a very long name for a very, very cold planet. 
Although the host star is not too far away, it's a small and rather cool red dwarf, whose light and heat barely even reach the planet. The temperatures out there fall as low as minus 370 degrees, which is only marginally warmer than absolute zero. The exoplanet is thus dark, gloomy, and covered in eternal ice that never thaws. Still, if it has a rocky core, it might generate some heat. So there's a chance that deep below the frozen surface, some unknown alien things might lurk. Dimidium, located roughly 50 light years away from our solar system, is a planet hostile to any living thing on many accounts. It's tidally locked to its sun which means one of its sides is always facing the star, while the other is always turned away. The hot side is heated to over 1,800 degrees, perpetually blown over with winds reaching 600 miles per hour. Despite Dimidium being a gas giant, it has a large amount of iron in it, which melts and evaporates in the atmosphere, creating clouds. And when those cool down, they fall on the surface in the infernal rain of molten iron. Oxygen is usually viewed as an element that might bring life to a planet, but this is definitely not the case for Osiris. Scientists were shocked to find oxygen on this planet, or rather around it, because it's eight times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. This extreme distance makes Osiris a living melting pot, where anything that could burn will. It's also responsible for a very short orbit of the planet around the star. A year on Osiris is just three and a half days on Earth. To boot, the atmosphere of the planet is constantly blown and melted away by the heat from its sun. Karat Exo 3b is neither as hot nor as cold as some of the others on this list, but it's terrifying in its own more insidious way. It's a gas giant similar in size to Jupiter, yet 20 times denser. This makes this exoplanet's gravity weigh down on everything on its surface 50 times more than it would on Earth. Stepping on it would be your ultimate doom, because you'd be immediately crushed by the density of its atmosphere. Karat 7b is another oven-like world. Its day-to-day -day temperature is over 4,000 degrees. Combined with the rocky surface, it presents an infernal landscape. The rocks on the ground bubble and boil, evaporating in the atmosphere where they cool down and eventually fall back on the surface in a brimstone rain. The saddest thing about Karat 7b is that it might have once been a gas giant whose atmosphere melted away from the heat, leaving only the scorched core. We're used to thinking that asteroids are the only free-floating rocks in space, but things like OTS-44 make you think twice and shiver. Imagine a planet about 11 times more massive than Jupiter roaming in space without being bound to the orbit of any star. Given its gargantuan size and mass, if OTS-44 collides with any other planet, it would utterly destroy it and go on floating as if nothing happened. Scarier still, scientists are sure there are millions of such rogue planets out there just waiting to be discovered. There's no hard proof of their existence yet, but theoretically, carbon planets have formed somewhere closer to the center of our galaxy. Any oxygen getting in their atmosphere will get into a reaction with carbon and transform into CO2, forming black, toxic clouds. On the ground, there would be oceans made of tar, spewing up geysers of methane and crude oil. There would be rains, too, but they'd be far from refreshing. Torrents of pure gasoline and hot liquid asphalt would blast the ground and probably burst into flames on impact. Hard to imagine anything that would survive such conditions. When you explode planets, things get red hot. Atmospheres are stripped away. Stuff is flying apart. Everything collapses. The world becomes brighter than a dozen suns. You squeeze your eyes shut and cover your ears. Your hair stands on end. The sheer power of a cosmic blast is terrifying. Some time before the explosion, you're hovering in almost complete darkness. Below, you see the moon, or what you think looks like the moon. The surface of this light-colored sphere is pockmarked with craters left by meteorites. You see huge, steep hills stretching for miles. It's Mercury, and right now, you're going to explode it. As if in slow-mo, you watch the planet fall apart. 
And then, in the blink of an eye, you see a wall of debris closing in on you. First, giant chunks of rock. Those are all that's left of the planet's solid crust and rocky mantle. The appearance and structure of the debris flying in your direction changes. Now, the stuff looks liquid, like splashes of quicksilver. That's Mercury's metallic core bursting apart. It used to take up 85% of the planet's volume. And finally, it's a firework of solid pieces again. It's the planet's solid core. The explosion is so powerful, it knocks Earth into a different orbit. The sun hiccups and swallows down an enormous cloud of dust. That's everything Mercury has left behind. But don't worry, our solar system won't lose any planets. This whole explosion thing is only a temporary experiment. Once you're done watching the show, you press another button and the planet gets back together, as if you've hit rewind. You approach the next planet on your way. Its surface is hiding under a super dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. If you decided to land on Venus, you'd watch thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. You'd see the planet's surface, reddish brown, dry, and incredibly hot. You'd probably walk across flat, smooth plains, covering two-thirds of the planet's surface. You'd gawk at volcanoes littering Venus, all 1,600 of them. Unfortunately, you won't be able to do that, because you press the button. Boom! Huge chunks of basalt fly away from the center of the explosion. That used to be the planet's 12-mile-thick crust. Then you spot bright burning meteors flying towards you at incredible speed. Those are chunks of Venus's molten rocky mantle. The fire rain seems endless, maybe because the mantle was 1,200 miles thick. But that's not the most massive part of the planet. The power of the explosion forces apart Venus's metallic iron core. This core used to be twice as wide as the mantle. You reach the blue marble of your home planet. What will its insides look like, scattered in space? From above, Earth looks pretty. 71% of its surface is blue, because of all that water, seas and oceans. There are also areas of green, yellow, and brown and white swirls. You press the button. The planet bursts apart in a hailstorm of rocks. They're what's left from Earth's thin crust and much, much thicker mantle. It used to take up nearly 84% of the entire planet's volume. You see the rocky rain change into something way more liquid. It's scorching hot iron and nickel that used to make up Earth's outer core. The metals weren't under enough pressure to be solid. The bang is so powerful that it takes apart Earth's inner core. It used to be a solid ball of iron and nickel. After the pieces fly apart, they follow their own orbits around the sun. The most massive chunks crash into the moon, and some travel further and get swallowed by our star. You can't linger. The red planet is waiting for you. The surface of Mars is covered with rusty colored dust. The thickness of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's seven feet thick. The ground is colored gold, brown, tan, and even greenish. The hue depends on the minerals that make up the soil. The planet's surface is rocky. It's covered with dry lake beds, craters, volcanoes, and canyons. Bang! Mars is a rocky planet. You have to dodge mountain-sized chunks of crust made up of volcanic basalt rock. What you see next looks as if you've blown up huge amounts of soft, rocky toothpaste. That used to be Mars's mantle, composed of oxygen, silicates, and other minerals. And then, the flying pieces get solid again. Ah, it's the planet's core's turn. It was solid, made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur. Billions and trillions of fragments of all sizes, from a small moon to pieces several feet wide, get launched in all directions. But only very few parts have enough momentum to leave the solar system. The whole event slightly changes Earth's orbit, and the temperature on our planet goes up by 18 degrees Fahrenheit. You leave rocky planets behind and close in on the first gas giant on your way. It's Jupiter. 
thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds hide its surface. They make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. You hit the button. This time, the view is different. Instead of chunks of solid crust, you see jet streams of gas accelerating from the planet's center. It's what used to be Jupiter's atmosphere, made up of hydrogen and helium gas. In no time, the matter hurtling away to space turns liquid. That's hydrogen changing its form under immense atmospheric pressure closer to the center of the planet. A bit later, the liquid is already a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium. And finally, something solid. It was probably Jupiter's core, 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. The gas giant's diameter was about 90,000 miles, but the blast lasts no more than half a second. The explosion of Jupiter is so strong, it evaporates smaller planets like Mars and Earth. The Sun remains pretty much untouched. It gets hotter and kind of unstable for a bit, but it doesn't last long. The next gas giant on your way is Saturn. At first sight, it looks as if the planet has a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by layers of clouds. Saturn's trademark rings are awesome and colorful, gray, beige, and tan. They're actually groups of tiny ringlets that are made up of floating chunks of water, ice, rocks, and dust. These chunks range in size from specks to massive skyscraper-sized pieces. While orbiting Saturn, they keep colliding, and larger pieces get shattered. You're surprised to see that the rings aren't perfectly round. They have bends caused by the gravitational pull from the nearby moons. 53 of them are confirmed. Titan, an icy world bigger than our moon, and even Mercury, is the largest. What you see looks eerily similar to what happened when you exploded Jupiter. There's only one difference. Saturn's rings break apart, sending rocks and ice flying into space at incredible speed. The largest pieces crash with the planet's moons, wiping away the smallest of them. You see streams of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium, with a bit of methane, ammonia, and water. They're moving at breakneck speed away from where the center of the planet used to be. After that, splashes of liquid matter, that's liquid hydrogen, that later turns metallic, and finally, the chunks of the solid core made up of rocky materials. You're looking at a beautiful blue-green sphere of the ice giant Uranus. The planet gets this unusual hue when the light from the sun gets reflected off the planet's surface. Plus, Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, with traces of methane gas that absorb the red light. Anyway, bang! This time, it's massive blobs of ice that are hurtling in your direction first. They used to be the part of the planet's ice mantle that once made up 80% of the planet's volume. But why does this ice look liquid? On Uranus, frozen liquid isn't solid like on Earth. Ice is a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia ice, and methane. It's often called the water ammonia ocean. After the bizarre ice rain, you see solid pieces of the planet's rocky core. It used to be small, no more than half the Earth's mass. Some of Uranus's moons get pulverized in the explosion, and several even get ejected out of the solar system. The explosion also slightly shifts Neptune's orbit. And the last planet on your way, Neptune. It looks blue because of a layer of swirling gas and permanent clouds. No time to linger. Boom! The planet doesn't have a solid surface. That's why, after pressing the button, you see Neptune's liquid mantle bursting. It looks like a water-filled balloon thrown down from the 50th floor. This sends splashes of water, ammonia, and methane ices away into space. It's followed by lava-like remains of the planet's mantle. It used to be liquid, red-hot, and rich in methane, ammonia, and water. That's what's left from Neptune's solid core made up of iron and other metals. This may look like a scene from a cool sci-fi movie or an astonishing painting, but it's actually real-life footage of Mars, the very planet known for its bright rust color. Layers of rock and dust cover the planet's surface. They consist of iron-rich minerals. That's why dust on Mars is mostly iron oxide. It floats in the atmosphere and creates an orange-red haze around the planet. 
But Mars has some even more amazing things, like these blue speckles on its surface. They look like a wind-sculpted sea of dunes around 19 miles wide. Astronauts saw these dunes at the northern polar cap of the planet. That's a region that covers an area approximately as big as Texas. The blue dunes, formed by winds, are shaped like long, weaving lines. The winds on Mars are relentless and strong. They turn the barren surface of the planet into terrains of grand beauty. These winds are influenced by many different factors. For example, temperature fluctuations to the way the planet's atmosphere circulates. The atmosphere is thin on Mars. That's the reason liquid water most likely can't exist there for any long period of time. That's why, even though Mars is only half the diameter of our planet, it has the same amount of dry land as Earth. A thin atmosphere is also the reason why wind needs to be exceptionally strong and fast to move the sand and form such shapes as these dunes. Winds usually move at 10 to 20 miles per hour on Mars. Anyway, even though the image looks pretty colorful, the dunes aren't actually blue. The bluish patches represent colder parts, while the warmer regions are yellowish-orange. The images were part of a set of photos released to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Odyssey, a spacecraft orbiting Mars. Mars has numerous sand dunes in different locations all over its surface. Some of them formed a billion years ago, like the ones in the Valles Marineris region. They haven't changed because both the atmospheric pressure and wind patterns there have remained the same. But some things do change. For example, some dunes get covered with frost. Here, the main dune has a series of dark patterns. It may be because frost comes and goes, depending on the season. Mars has four seasons, just like Earth, but they're twice as long as ours. It's because Mars needs around two Earth years to orbit the Sun. Seasons are harsher in the south of the planet than in the north. During southern winter, the planet is farthest away from the Sun. Mars moves pretty slowly, and its orbit is elliptical, different from the orbit of Earth, which is almost circular. Spring on Mars is a season with plenty of dust storms that start in one part of the planet and, eventually, turn into huge storms. They become so large, they blanket the entire planet. Each planet of our solar system has something that makes it special. Jupiter, for example, is not only the largest planet, more than twice as big as all other planets combined, but it also has the biggest ocean in the solar system. Jupiter is made of similar elements to the Sun. They're mostly helium and hydrogen. In the deeper parts of the planet's atmosphere, temperature and pressure increase. That's why the hydrogen gas gets compressed and turns into liquid. That gives Jupiter the biggest ocean, but it's made of hydrogen, not water. There's also a theory that somewhere halfway to Jupiter's center, the pressure increases so much that electrons start getting squeezed out of hydrogen atoms. This allows the liquid to conduct electricity as effectively as most metals do. Jupiter is rotating fast, which creates electrical currents and generates a strong magnetic field. But as a gas giant, the planet doesn't have a firm surface. The planet's swirls and stripes are cold, windy clouds of water and ammonia. Jupiter also has the iconic Great Red Spot, which is an insanely large storm with crimson-colored clouds spinning counterclockwise. Winds there are way faster than any hurricane on our planet. The Great Red Spot has slightly changed throughout time and is currently bigger than our planet. It's 1.3 times as wide as Earth. Scientists have discovered that its roots extend more than 200 miles into Jupiter's atmosphere. A regular tropical cyclone we see on our planet can only extend 9 miles from the top to the bottom of the storm. These days, the red spot is becoming smaller and taller at the same time. Jupiter also has dozens of moons and a couple of rings. But unlike Saturn's rings, these are quite faint and mostly made of dust, not ice. Also, there's a salty ocean under the surface of Jupiter's biggest moon, Ganymede. It's hidden below a thick icy crust. It's likely to contain more water than all surface water reservoirs we have on Earth combined. The theory says this ocean is around 60 miles deep, 10 times greater than the deepest point of our planet's oceans. Jupiter and Saturn contain 10 million tons of precious stones. The pressure inside these planets' atmospheres can actually turn carbon into small pieces of diamonds. If you put these diamonds under extreme temperatures and pressure, they can melt. This would probably result in some sort of diamond rain. In the beginning, our solar system was just a swirling cloud of gas and dust. It eventually developed into a spinning disk with the central star in the middle. 
Almost all planets in our solar system move counterclockwise around the sun. Venus is the only planet that rotates in a clockwise direction, and Uranus rotates on its side. These planets are most likely different because long ago, huge asteroids collided with them and kind of knocked them off their course. There's a chance Venus could be a habitable planet. It's definitely not a place you'd want to live now, not with its sulfuric acid clouds and tremendous atmospheric pressure. It's 90 times greater than that on Earth. At here insanely high temperatures, the conditions on Venus are very unfavorable for people. At 863 degrees Fahrenheit, Venus is hotter than Mercury, even though it's further away from the Sun. This happens because there's too much carbon dioxide in Venus's atmosphere. It traps heat, which causes the temperature to rise way higher than it's supposed to. But simulations show that around 700 million years ago, Venus might have been a nice place with moderate temperatures and liquid water. Those conditions were slightly similar to those we have on Earth now. Uranus is not a gas giant. It's actually made of ice. The atmosphere contains methane, which makes the planet look blue. It has 27 moons, two sets of rings, and lots of ice in its atmosphere. A day on Uranus lasts just a little bit over 17 hours. That's how long it takes the planet to complete a single rotation on its axis. But its tilt is so pronounced that most of the time, either one or the other pole is pointed toward the sun. That's why the daytime length at the North Pole is almost half a year, and a year on Uranus is as long as 84 years. If you lived on Uranus closer to its North Pole, you'd be able to see the sun in the sky for 42 years. That would be the summer. After this, the sun would go down, and you'd have to live the next 42 years in the darkness. It'd be the winter on the planet. Neptune is the most distant and the smallest of the gas giants. The gravity on the planet is similar to the one we have on Earth, but you wouldn't be able to stand on Neptune's surface. It's gas, not solid land. Triton, the biggest of the planet's moons, orbits Neptune in a very unusual way. It moves backward compared to the rest of the planet's moons. Triton is also slowly spiraling inward toward Neptune. One day, billions of years from now, it's likely to get torn apart by the planet's gravitational forces and become just a ring around Neptune. This ring will continue being pulled inward until it eventually crashes into the planet. Pluto is a dwarf planet, and a year there lasts 248 Earth years. But even though it's not even a planet, Pluto still has several interesting things to offer, like floating mountains. Pluto's nitrogen glaciers carry countless isolated hills, each up to several miles across. They're likely to be fragments of water ice from the dwarf planets surrounding uplands. Nitrogen ice is denser than water ice, so scientists think water ice hills float in a sea of frozen nitrogen, just like icebergs in the Arctic Ocean here on Earth. You're gazing up at the night sky. Wow! For much of our history, we've been looking for life among these stars and the planets near them. But space has eyes too. And there's someone out there looking at us, maybe. Scientists claim that at least 29 distant planets may be watching us right now. So comb your hair and smile. We've so far identified at least 1,715 neighboring star systems in the Milky Way that can detect our planet with conventional telescopes. These stars are located in our galaxy. So if they were to point their telescopes at our Sun, sooner or later they would see a small dot that passes between our home star and the observer. This is called a transit. It's a method of detecting planets in astronomy. For example, you can observe transit phenomenon right at home with a telescope. You have to point it at the Sun and wait. Then you'll see Mercury. That's the closest planet to the Sun, and now you see it as a small dot. Mercury transit process can last about 5 hours, and this phenomenon happens about 14 times in a century. You'll be able to observe the next transit on November 13, 2032. Mark your calendar. Likewise, you can observe Venus, the second planet from the Sun. But because it's farther away, its transits are less frequent. The last one was in 2004 and 2012. The next pair of transits is expected in 2117 and 2125. Hey, I won't be around then. So these star systems have the opportunity to observe our planet. But long-range telescopes work a little differently. 
Actually, the observer will not see a black dot with the sun in the background. The telescope will measure the brightness of our star. When Earth begins its transit between the sun and the observer, the telescope will record a slight drop in the brightness of the star because our planet is blocking the path of the sun's rays. Those faraway scientists of extraterrestrial civilizations will be able to calculate this drop in brightness and determine the size of our planet. But not all 1,700-plus star systems may have extraterrestrial life. Scientists have narrowed it down to 29 planets near some of these stars. They're potentially habitable. That means these planets are roughly Earth-like in size and within the habitable zone of their host star. That means they're not too close to the star, so it's not too hot for a potential life. The water doesn't evaporate there like in a boiling pot. And they're not too far away, so it's not too cold and the water doesn't freeze into thick sheets of ice. And since water is the basis of life, we can assume that civilization might exist there. Theoretically, these planets could have seen Earth transits in the last 5,000 years. So, while we were building the pyramids of Giza or Stonehenge, an extraterrestrial civilization may have been watching us. One of these planets is only 11 light years from our home. Near the Ross 128 star, a red dwarf in the constellation Virgo. There's an exoplanet about twice the size of Earth and right in the habitable zone of its host star. Theoretically, the inhabitants of this planet could see Earth transit the Sun on a regular basis for 2,000 years. But about 900 years ago, the planet lost its position and can no longer continue observation. The other planet where Earth can be seen transiting is 12.5 light years away, near the star called Tea Garden. The window for observing our planet will open there in about 29 years. We're betting heavily on the TRAPPIST-1 star system. It hosts at least seven exoplanets, almost like our solar system. And four of them are in the habitable zone of the star. But they won't be able to start observing Earth until 16 centuries from now. But we can try to make contact with these planets right now. They're all close enough to us to pick up our radio signals. Radio waves can travel through space at the speed of light, and our planet has been emitting radio signals continuously since 1895. So we're like noisy neighbors in the radio spectrum. If there's a planet somewhere with an intelligent civilization within 125 light years of us, our radio noise would have already reached them. The only problem is, it would take about the same time to get a response from that civilization. The other problem with radio is that any civilization uses it for a relatively short period. Even now on Earth, we use Bluetooth and fiber optics more than radio, except for maybe traffic reports. And over time, all the radio noise we create will simply disappear. Also, radio communication assumes that an extraterrestrial civilization is advanced enough to use this technology. But who knows? Maybe there are life forms in space that are really different from ours. Our radio signals already could have reached that planet, but its inhabitants simply aren't capable of receiving them. And the moment these life forms build antennas to receive the signal, we'll no longer emit them. But we don't lose hope, and we even send encrypted radio signals into space to communicate with extraterrestrial civilizations. In 1974, we sent the Arecibo message into interstellar space. If some civilization can decipher it, they'll get a rectangle like this. It has all the information about humanity. At the top is our number system, then the atomic numbers, and then our DNA, which is pictured below. Then a human being itself, of course. Below is a diagram of our solar system, Earth. The third planet from the Sun is slightly elevated. This is how the extraterrestrial civilization will understand which planet this message came from. Below is a diagram of the Arecibo radio telescope itself. Another option how to deliver a message to a distant planet is to literally send a mail delivery there. It could be a space probe. And we've already done that. These are Voyagers 1 and 2. They were launched in 1977 and are still operational. 
In 2012, Voyager 1 became the first-ever human-made object in interstellar space. It travels to distant stars and carries a message written on a golden record. The disc contains greetings in 55 Earth languages, a lot of music from different parts of our planet. Different sounds like ocean noise, human voices, and animal sounds. In addition, there are 116 images on the record. These are pictures of people and earthly landscapes. In these pictures, there's information about the sun and our DNA. The record case contains instructions and a needle to play the record. There's also a map of our galaxy's pulsars so that astronomers from an extraterrestrial civilization can find our solar system. The main disadvantage of sending a message this way is time. Voyager 1 will reach its first stop, the Gliese 445 star, in 40,000 years. Voyager 2 will reach the Ross 248 star in 42,000 years. And in about 296,000 years, it'll pass Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. I can't wait. Also, an extraterrestrial civilization can detect us with calculations and formulas. All it takes is a little observation of the sun. In star systems with planets, the host star doesn't stand still. It rotates around a small orbit. This is because the heavy star attracts the planet, but the planet also has its own gravity and resists. This shifts the star a little and causes it to orbit around. An extraterrestrial civilization can calculate this shift of the sun and determine the mass of the planets near the star. Using such a method, astronomers were able to find 548 exoplanets. Now suppose we made contact with an extraterrestrial civilization near the closest star, Proxima Centauri. There's indeed an exoplanet there, but radiation from the host star would destroy any life forms. But imagine we still got a return signal. It would be the slowest chat in history, because our message would take 4.2 years to reach the planet, and we'd have to wait another 4.2 years to get a response. And so we arranged to meet. This civilization doesn't know how to fly into space. So we have to take the first step. Although Proxima Centauri is the closest star to our solar system, it takes about 73,000 years to travel there by conventional rocket. So we have to learn to travel at the speed of light. But even then, it would take 4.2 years to travel there. Imagine if we found extraterrestrial life on the other side of the Milky Way. Our galaxy is 100,000 light-years wide. So the journey from edge to edge would take 100 millennia. So, we either have to cheat the laws of physics or transfer all of human civilization to a giant spaceship that will travel from star to star for thousands of years. And when it launches from Earth, only the great 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 and many more greats of the first crew will be able to see another star system from the spaceship portal. Hey, can you move your head? I'm trying to see out the window.